to offer a lecture, uh, particularly a brief one, on Aristotle on the perfect life might be to mislead an audience into believing that Aristotle himself thought that he himself um, was living such a life or being able to supply the last word on that most intriguing and indeed elusive of questions, namely, how should I live my life? And in fact, in the ethical treatises that I mentioned in the previous lecture, the Nicomachean and the Eudamian Ethics, we actually get two rather different uh, perfect lives as candidates for the perfect life. Now in the course of this lecture, I'll go into those two possibilities, but I think we should rehearse some points raised in the previous lecture on the moral and intellectual virtues first, because these are going to be foundational for all considerations of the kind of life worth living, worth every effort of ours to try to live. And even if Aristotle's prescriptions seem so ideal as to be merely intoxicating, they will at least in a very small dose clarify his understanding of the problem of conduct and how to deal with it. So let me begin with the intellectual virtues, which are the powers by which we are able to understand the causes of things, the causes of events in the world. The intellectual virtues embrace scientific knowledge, episteme. Uh, they are the means by which we actually become knowing beings, homo sapiens. And of course, absent a knowledge of ourselves and the world in which we live, our life would be a perpetual childhood, but without its charm. So surely a perfect life is going to be one that is guided by and indeed directed towards scientific, systematic, developed knowledge, including self-knowledge. In its way then, Techni enters into this also because there's an artistic dimension to the life worth living. Now, these are not Aristotle's words, but I think he would quite concur that we are, as it were, artistic objects of a self-defining, self-creating nature. And the whole perfectionist scheme in Aristotle's ethics and psychology is the way of getting a set of potentialities realized ever more fully. Metaphorically speaking, to get a work of art ever more complete, just as perfected friendship is an ever more complete and sympathetic relationship between persons who are relevantly comparable in virtue. The right kind of life also calls upon us to make the right kind of choices. Not only must we act in the course of life, but we also have to have good reasons for acting. We have to have good reasons in the sense that our actions have to be something other than merely reactions. Now in the previous lecture, I said that one who helps another who has fallen into a well, but does so as a result of post-hypnotic suggestion, is not described as virtuous because the conduct in question is more by way of a reaction to hypnotic influence than it is by way of an agentic action by an intending person desiring to bring about something good. Virtuous acts are performed by virtuous people. It's not just in the mechanics of the act that we find the virtue. It's in the character of the actor that we come to understand the action to be virtuous. Well, similarly, if we're going to aspire to the right kind of life, we have to be able to make decisions based on good reasons. We've got to do what we do because we have a good reason for doing it. And this ability to articulate sound and defensible reasons for action is itself a form of wisdom. It's a form of knowledge, a kind of prudential knowledge for which the Greek word is phronesis. So as the philosophically wise man possesses Sophia, the practically wise person possesses phronesis. And in contrast to episteme, phronesis does have this practical side to it. It guides one toward making the right kind of choice, the right kind of decision. The calculative and rational powers have been deployed in such a way as to weigh competing options and possibilities and to lead to an understanding of the various consequences likely to attend one course of action versus another. Now the right kind of life also finds us committing ourselves, committing our rational powers, 
our thought processes, even our daydreams, our deepest reflections to what is worth thinking about. And Aristotle in his writings does insist that when all is said and done, the right kind of life, to the extent that we are contemplating anything at all, is a life in which we are contemplating the best things, the things that are most worthy. Not just contemplating anything. In politics, for example, it is timeotetan, the very best. Democracy is ruled by the most meritorious, those of the highest merit. We should be contemplating that when contemplating matters of statecraft. That is, given a choice between contemplating issues of philosophical consequence and contemplating changes in the stock market. A more flourishing life is lived by the former contemplative person than by the latter, all due respect to the Harvard Business School. It's not that there's anything wrong with spending one's time thinking about the stock market. It's that if that's all you're thinking about in hours of serious contemplation, then in fact you've lowered your ceiling to issues of that kind, which are transitory, culturally defined, episodic. Now why should we aspire to moral excellence at all? Why should we aspire to what in the previous lecture I referred to as the moral virtues? Why should one be courageous as opposed to being a coward? Why should one be temperate as opposed to being extreme? Why should one confine one's anger to a kind of noble proportioned anger instead of being in a perpetual rage? Is the right answer to that question a utilitarian answer? Well, you know, if you do it that way, you get by better in the world. No, we've got to go back to Aristotle's theory of causation when we raise the question, why should we be a certain way? Because the answer will then depend on the causes of our being a certain way. Now, when Aristotle raises this question, he serves up an answer that at first seems almost simplistic. He says, well, look, the question here is, why should I live a virtuous life, or why should I try to be noble? This is just a special version of the general question, why do I do anything? Why does anyone do anything? Now this refers to the actual doing of something, not just reacting to things in the manner of a reflex, such as taking one's hand off a hot object. But why do I, in the fullest sense of intending to do something, actually set about to do something, do something with intentionality, ekousios, as opposed to akousios. Particularly, why do I do those things that involve a deliberated choice between alternatives? Now this deliberated choice in the Greek is prohiresis, which is the power of deliberated choice. Why do I deliberately choose action A over action B when both are possible? Ask someone why the decision was made to see a doctor. The reply will be of this sort. Well, to preserve or improve my health. Now then ask further. Why do you want to be in good health? Well, if I'm not in good health, I probably won't be able to hold down my job, and I'll also have uh, aches and pains. Ah, now why is it that you want to hold down a good job? Now, if we keep this kind of questioning going, it obviously mustn't lead to an infinite regress. There must be a terminus ad quem, a, a point toward which all these questions are headed, some ultimate point where it really no longer makes any sense to ask, and why that? And so Aristotle concludes in a disarmingly common sense way that the ultimate end toward which all other desiderata are, are but steps along the way is, no surprise here, happiness expressed in the Greek as eudaimonia. Now this Greek word may be translated in such a way as to mislead in the matter of Aristotle's theory. It's a word that lends itself to more than one translation and to various and subtle interpretations. And depending upon how you do translate it, you can end up with theories rather removed from Aristotle's own. The terminus ad quem, the that for the sake of which, we make various choices and take one and then another course of action is to achieve eudaimonia. 
So there's going to be much weight attached to how we render the term eudaimonia. In many translations, as I say, eudaimonia is just rendered as happiness. So everything we do, we do for the sake of happiness. Now again, I don't want to cast either myself or Aristotle as H. L. Mencken's Puritanism, fearful that someone somewhere may be happy. But certainly Aristotle's entire ethical philosophy, his whole treatise on friendship, expresses nothing but the gravest reservations about one whose behavior is guided chiefly by considerations of pleasure. He classifies such a person as essentially an addict in the Greek, an apolostikos. This sort of life is too close to the brain in a vat existence. Eudaimonia certainly cannot mean that sort of life. So what then does it mean as Aristotle uses the term? He certainly doesn't mean what the psychologist Maslow would have in mind with a phrase peak emotional experience as in whoopee or now I see it or hallelujah. It's not that. I think the best understanding of eudaimonia, the best rendering of it, is not that some point is reached that could be called the eudaimonic point. It's not some transient state. Rather, it's a veritable form or mode of life. It's a life that has a certain character and stripe to it, properly described as a flourishing life. Eudaimonia is flourishing. We can say now that the end or goal of our deliberated courses of action is a flourishing life. Now this is not in opposition to happiness, but it gives happiness a certain coloration, a deep and lasting coloration that the English word, the English expression, be happy, uh, will not quite convey. In fact, that the English word happy has a tendency now to obscure. Well then the problem of conduct translates into the question of how to achieve that flourishing life that is the ultimate end of our choices and our actions. If the goal of all of our actions ultimately were eudaimonia, then what indeed would eudaimonia be for us? Aristotle here claims that we are the only candidates for such a life. Non-human animals on his account experience pleasure, certainly experience pain, can attain a kind of happiness, but one that is limited to what we might call creature comforts, avoidance of pain, access to food and drink, the comfort of collective living, etc. Such states are not the outcome of a rationally deliberated choice, but rather of instinctual impulses. Now the grounds on which Aristotle would deny non-human animals eudaimonia, and by the way would also deny very young children, natural slaves, madmen, the same eudaimonia, well this presupposes a rational plan. To have access to eudaimonia, it is presupposed that what is being realized is a rational plan of life as intended by the actor. So again we find something different from what the apolosticos is seeking. We're finding instead what a rational being would seek as a form of life capable of realizing ever more fully the rich range of potentialities within a being of that kind. What does this eudaimonic form of life entail by way of our commitments and deliberated choices? Here's a question for all seasons. Now on this question, Aristotle's two major ethical works offer alternatives. Scholars still debate which of the two was actually Aristotle's preferred choice, but I'm not quite sure if that's the right question. I think the prior question is this. Did Aristotle have any ground on which to choose one over the other? Or was he left at the end of the day with a kind of, well, here are the options, they are not entirely compatible with each other, and it's not quite clear that you can choose one over the other decisively, do you see? To some extent an open question. What are the alternatives? We begin by noting that we are rational beings. This is the defining feature of our nature. Now what defines a fish, we might say, is aquatic life. We might say that what is defining of a bird is flight. So if we were to grant that fish and birds on Aristotle's account cannot have eudaimonic forms of life, let's just say for argument's sake that we'll pretend that fish and birds 
can have a eudaimonic form of life. Now what would be most incompatible with eudaimonia for a bird? What would be most incompatible with a eudaimonic form of avian life would be for the bird to be stripped of its power of flight because the power of flight so defines the essential nature of a bird that to be stripped of that is to be stripped of the central defining quality of this creature. A bird in a cage puts all heaven in a rage, said Blake. Similarly, the fish out of water. We have that expression. For goodness sake, I felt like a fish out of water, meaning I found myself in a setting so utterly incompatible with what I take to be my essential nature that I could not even be myself in a setting of that kind. That's what we mean when we say, I felt like a fish out of water. Well, what then would most frustrate the possibility of eudaimonia, given that the creature in question is essentially a rational being. Well, if you take it as the defining attribute, the essential nature of man, rationality itself, the capacity for reflective, abstract, rational thought, the contemplation of that which is greatest and best and most enduring, then clearly the eudaimonic form of life is a contemplative form of life. A eudaimonic life, then, is a life spent by one, devoted by one, to a contemplation of first things, things of first importance and greatest excellence. To clarify his position, Aristotle tells us that this life is very much like life, I love the phrase, life on the Isle of the Blessed. He says that this is a life lived very much like the life of the gods, you know, like the life of the Olympians. The gods don't do what they do out of necessity, but for the sheer pleasure of doing it. There aren't any contingent impositions on the gods. If you can find a form of human life where what you do, you do for the sheer fulfillment arising from doing it, doing it for its own sake and not for the sake of anything else, then you will have found something akin to a god's life, a life on the Isle of the Blessed. Perhaps a useful example is that of children at play, though this is not eudaimonia as Aristotle intends the term to be understood. The child at play is engaged in activities that are not for the sake of some other end, but that are ends in themselves. Recall Schiller's claim in his letters on the aesthetic education of man. Schiller says, man is never so authentically himself as when at play. Now if the contemplative life is engaged in not because it results in greater material wealth, greater sensual pleasure, a longer life, but for the sheer, deep, lasting, cognitive and spiritual gratification aroused in you and sustained in you by contemplative devotion to those things that matter most, that is nearly a divine kind of life, one that approximates eudaimonia. Well, oh my, is this getting too close to taking the lotus position, living solely on pumpkin seeds and learning one's mantra? Surely the Aristotle who had devoted much of his own life to examining cuttlefish and classifying the entire animal kingdom, studying political constitutions, human anatomy, um, the anatomy of monkeys, surely this Aristotle must have had uh, little time for the lotus position. So we ask then whether the contemplative life is a life of inactivity. Quite the contrary. It is a most active life. It is not one of lonely contemplation, for man is by nature a social animal, essentially a social and political animal, which means that there could not be a eudaimonic form of life lived in isolation beyond the law, beyond the hearth, beyond the polis. Aristotle actually refers to that figure in Homer and says of the hearthless, stateless, lawless man, that he is someone who either rises above humanity or falls beneath it. Aristotle takes the example from Homer. And he says, if you had this hearthless, stateless uh, uh, entity, this is either someone who's above humanity, sort of a superhuman, or something beneath humanity. He may be a god, because a god doesn't need a hearth. 
or a law or a state or anything like that. He may be something subhuman, but the completed human being is found within the polis, at the hearth, obedient to the law. So even this contemplative life is a life lived in society and lived in the world. So far that may give us little more than what might be called a street address. Now to this we might add, lived with like-minded people. But this begins to sound like uh, All Souls College, Oxford. Uh, I kid. The privileged few enter the inner sanctum, pull down the shades, and ascend to the contemplative life, at least until the sherry is poured. Now, in another sense, it sounds almost monastic, but I'm not quite sure that this is what Aristotle envisages, nor am I sure that he doesn't. Let's turn to yet another possibility developed in his other major ethical treatise. We are by nature social animals. We are by nature political animals. We have this very strong inclination to live in each other's company. We seek that most rewarding of personal relationships, friendship. Now friendship by its nature is to be grounded in principle. There are at least several principles that might ground friendship. We rehearse them. There is the pleasure principle. There is the utilitarian principle. And then there are the perfectionist principles of virtue. The principles of virtue at the individual level are like the principles of law that govern the good state. Now in this we find some possibilities being worked out for a course of life. It's important that one follow this here. Let's say that the just state the state whose laws are just is the state that requires through the force and power and authority of law that we behave the way the man of virtue would behave habitually and by nature. That is to say the law may require all of us to do what a rational being at his best would be doing by choice. And by conditioning us to behave this way that is, with the force of law requiring us to develop lawful habits, the rule of law conduces to a virtuous form of conduct. Now, of course, in guiding us toward virtuous conduct, it renders us ever more fit, not merely for life within the polis, but guess what? Fit for friendships of a certain kind. It renders us ever more fit for the most rewarding of interpersonal experiences and the flourishing life that becomes possible thereby. Well now, what would be the best form of life one could live understood in these terms? Well the best form of life would be that of the lawgiver. It would be the life of one immersed in the political needs and realities of his time and contributing to the polis through his own virtuous conduct contributing in such a way that the state, like the person, perfects itself and does so by regulating itself ever more consistently with the principles and tenets of reason, proportionality, prudence, balance, harmony, fitness, aptness. Remember the Greek word for fitness, for a kind of hand-in-glove fitness, is harmonia. The word for the musical version would be melodia, but harmony here is something that's not simply acoustic. It's something apt or fitting and right. It's a product of reason and reasonable calculations. Its opposite is discordia, and Homer tells us what happened when she came to the wedding party. Well, we do go to the doctor for the sake of preserving health, and we go to the law for the purpose of securing a reasonable, prudent, balanced, harmonious form of life. The rule of law attracts us, and we attach our fidelity to it, not simply because it threatens us with punishment. That's the wrong model of the law. That's the Gyges ring case. That's the law as tyranny. That's the law stopping us from doing what we'd be inclined to do if nobody could see us, that sort of thing. Now Aristotle sees the law very much the way he sees the rule of reason. Indeed, he calls the rule of reason a royal or princely rule. 
It inclines. It does not determine. It's not a tyrannical rule. It's a princely rule. The rule set by good example. The law is supposed to function in the same way. When he describes the law as philicon, this friendly characteristic of the law, we see in the law something of what we see in the good friend. I want to pause on, on this point of philicon. What is it that attaches us to the law? You see, quite apart from one being fearful of the law's punishments, one gravitates quite positively, positively toward the rule of law. And Aristotle says it's because the law has this property, which in the Greek he calls philicon. It has a friendly property. Just like the good friend who wants what's best for us for our sake, the just laws would incline us to behave in ways that are best for us for our sake. Now, as I said in the previous lecture, the good law, the rule of justice, the regime of justice, calls upon us to do the things that make us better. It is not so much threatening us with punishment as it is holding out possibilities imminent in a rational being, capable but not perhaps naturally given to a reasonable and decent form of life. Now, how do we broker what seem to be the competing claims of a life of political activity as lawgiver, as citizen, as representative and leader of the polis, and that contemplative life of the wise man who, as if he were on the Isle of the Blessed, is engaged in deep thought on first things for the sake of thought itself and not for the sake of anything else? Well, I want to give you a matter-of-fact, unequivocal, non-philosophical, almost doctrinaire answer to that question once and for all so that we never have to deal with it again. I don't think you can broker these competing claims, and I don't think Aristotle thought so either. There is a line too thin separating being in the world and being of the world, and even the saint cannot help but cross it if only to see the other life in perspective. There is a fundamental tension between a life of activity and a life of contemplation, even granting that contemplation is itself a kind of activity. There isn't any way around it at all. Once a scholar decides to devote himself or herself to a life of study, trying to get things right, and recognizing that by nature we are fallible beings, it becomes impossible to take decisive action at the daily political level of decision-making, industrial, corporate, bureaucratic life. Do I support this government policy? What do I say about the neighbor's loud music and chemical lawn? After all, on a certain construal, well, if you look at it this way, well, if you interpret it through the eyes of the, uh, this is the Hamletian life that is the life of the disinterested scholar the philosophically inclined person who recognizes that error stalks our most cherished theories. The contemplative life really, as the Hindus and Buddhists recognize, is a contemplative life. But it is a life that by its very nature must remove one from the day-to-day -day affairs of the world. The life of Pericles, the life of any great political leader, any great lawgiver, is a life not just just of activity. Of course, Aristotle understands that contemplation is activity, it's not a trance state. But the political leader is changing the world and often changing it with his hands. He's changing the world with military force, with currency, with enacted legislation that carries heavy penalties for defiance, trade agreements, rhetoric, propaganda, the marshalling of resources of the community, threats, praises, artifices of one sort or another, recruiting dramatists and musicians, painters and sculptors so that art can be used for rhetorical purposes. Great things can thus be brought about. So who's on the horizon as we weigh these possibilities? All of the resources of the Hellenistic world are going to be pulled together by whom? Not by a philosopher, but by Alexander the Great, and deployed for the express purpose of Hellenizing the world. This is a leader that Aristotle had an opportunity to teach in his youth. Now, as Alexander the Great, he presents the man of practical affairs. How do we Hellenize the world? Well, we do it in every way we can, including having all of our soldiers marry Persian women. <laughs>
Alas, by the time Alexander the Great came back from his conquests, he's found wearing Persian headdress, quasi-divine divine regalia, replete with crown, as the Athenians giggle in the street. So he certainly Hellenized much of the world, but he also transformed himself to a considerable extent. That's the man of practical affairs. And that's the dilemma faced by all who weigh the choices between a contemplation of first things and making the world conform to one's best judgments.